Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, 18 Ways to Screw Up Your Reality Capture Workflow. Um, I'm excited to have a bunch of different uh, panelists today that are going to talk about some some mistakes. As we all know, uh, <laughs> no one is perfect, and most of us uh, who've gotten into this industry over the years have uh, screwed up plenty of times along the way trying to figure out uh, the best way to do things. So, should be a fun day, uh, or at least a fun hour. Um, uh, listening to some of these mistakes and uh, hopefully there's some great takeaways for all of you listening in uh, things uh, you can learn from our mistakes instead of uh, having to learn them yourselves the hard way so with that uh, do a little housekeeping here everyone is muted during the presentation um, uh, in your little go to webinar sidebar you can ask questions via chat during the session and at the end I'll be going through those and queuing up questions for our panelists. And the webinar is being recorded, and about a week or so afterwards, uh, we will send out a, a link to that recording for you to download if you want to share it with anybody else, or if for some reason uh, your dogs start barking and you have to, uh, you know, go out in the middle of the webinar, you can always watch it later and see what you missed. So, uh, yeah. Uh, in terms of the agenda, we are going to do a quick introduction of our wonderful presenters, and then we'll go through a couple different categories of mistakes. Uh, we've got some leftovers if we manage to breeze through, and then we will do a Q&A session at the end. So, yeah, let's talk about our presenters. So, uh, first up here, we've got uh, Greg Hale. He is the... Uh, CTO and disruptor at Hale Tip, uh, and uh, Greg founded Hale Tip in 2014. Uh, has a really interesting background uh, in the construction industry before getting into reality capture, and I just learned this today is an adjunct professor at RIT. Um, and I have no idea what he means by he leads with his head literally, so I'll let Greg explain that if he sees fit. Say hello, Greg. Hello, everybody. Yeah, just fun fact, I've uh, more than once ran into some walls head on, literally and figuratively. So that might explain a few things as we go through the presentation. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, we also have with us uh, Ted Mort, who is the Chief Innovation Officer, officer with Zealous. Uh, and uh, he was appointed to the US IBD Board of Directors and a uh, longtime chairman for the Technology Committee. Uh, uh, had the pleasure of working with Ted uh, on uh, a number of US IBD initiatives. And uh, uh, I don't think Ted and I have ever actually had the pleasure of working together on a real project, but we'll fix that one of these days. Uh, <laughs> say hello, Ted. Hey, you know what? We got to keep working on it. We'll find something. Can't travel halfway around the world without uh, coming back with a, a project or two. So, um, look, really happy to be here, excited, honored to be on this panel of uh, presenters. Uh, there's going to be some great information shared today. All right. Thanks, Ted. We also have Laser Larry Klein Kemper, uh, who is the uh, CTO at Landmark Services. Um, uh, which was founded in 2007. So Larry was uh, very early into the uh, reality capture world. Um, he is also a licensed architect. Much and, to the uh, Texas board's dismay. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, Larry and I will actually be uh, speaking in a couple things at SPAR, uh, one of them together. Uh, so yeah, obviously, uh, say hello, Larry. Hello, everybody. Um, unfortunately, Larry. Oh, can see him uh, wearing a hat at uh, trade shows. So keep an eye out for it. And then last, we have got uh, Zoltan. Uh, Zoltan is with uh, Clearage 3D. So we, we kind of snuck one of our own experts here in on this panel. And um, uh, Zoltan's had a really fascinating background and uh, spent time working as a reseller, uh, lots of time in the software, just practicing, and uh, we, we uh, snagged him and brought him onto the team 
to uh, to help us out with some of our uh, product management stuff. And uh, he likes to cook Indian food, but I'm actually going to say that he uh, he's also a software developer on the side, and he actually just finished writing a. Uh, a little plugin for Revit that allows you to virtually laser scan anything you've modeled, uh, which I think is pretty amazing. Uh, so say hello, Zoltan. Hello, everybody. All righty. Right. Yeah, let's let's take a look at some of our issues. Get into the meat and potatoes. So. Yes, field work and scanning workflow mistakes is going to be our first category. And our first speaker will be Mr. Greg Hale. So tell us about this one, Greg. All right. So I'm sure I'm not the only one to screw this up over time here. Um, so story background, we had a field tech head out to a uh, facility about three hours away from home base. Uh, went through, scanned the entire facility. I want to say it's about a full day's worth of work. Um, got back to the office the next day, started processing scans, and lo and behold, the upper 30 degrees, or basically the, anything up in the ceiling, was not in the scan work. So there really wasn't too much of a way around it other than to head back down to the site and rescan everything. So a couple of lessons learned from that. Certainly always check all of your scanner settings for um, you know changes in job sites, et cetera. Don't feel like you can just jump in from the last job and get going, even though there might be a little bit of a rush. And always check that data before you come off site. Um, nothing like leaving uh, the site with only partial data when you think you had it all. So we all get in a rush. We, uh, we all want to get the job done. And sometimes there's a bit of a push from the clients to get in and out of the facilities. But definitely be careful. Go through it. I know it seems like a bit of a no-brainer. But spend the extra time before you head home and you know check through that data before you come off site because it's a lot easier to, to stay overnight and do it again than it is to you know pack up uh head back and then book travel again to get back on site especially for the the long distances so well, it's no will... fun getting that kind of scan data yeah this this one really spoke to me because you know what we always tell clients is well the beauty of laser scanning is it captures everything and then it turns out <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's the, uh, the upside and downside of the push button scanners. They're they're really nice in the field, but only if they're got, if they have the right default settings. So, and Ted, why don't you tell us about uh, inconsistent leveling? Yeah, I'll tell you what the um, the a lot of the scanners do have a lot you know these built-in tools like you had mentioned uh, a lot of presettings, and uh, we begin to rely a lot on those. Uh, internally, I know that we've relied a lot on the inclinometers that are built into the machine. And, you know, floor flatness, when you're performing that kind of work, it's, it's critical that you have a couple QA checks. And they're, they're difficult to do. I mean, even if you are relying on the, the inclinometer, uh, if that's off just a hair or, you know, maybe it got bumped in transit, uh, there aren't a lot of secondary things that you can fall back on as a safety net. And what we started doing where floor flatness or levelness of the information was critical is we'll send out a laser plane with the crew. And when they project that laser out across the, the site, we'll put up some black and white targets just right along with that laser. Now, we might not use these for our registration, but they provide us an excellent secondary QA when we're back in the office. We can make sure that they all contain the same elevation. Uh, if they don't, they also provide us the resource to go through and balance the project out. Um, you know, this might not be necessary if you're running a, a survey loop through the entire project, but I know a lot of us are out there uh, using just the, the tools themselves and the software that comes with it for registration without that survey control. Uh, this is just a, a quick method to get it done. and You don't have to use a professional grade plane. Uh, you can you know, pick something up at a consumer level for a few hundred bucks it could save you that second trip out to the site. Yeah, I love this one, Ted, because, you know, I, I always say as a general rule, you should always scan on survey control, but the reality is sometimes you just can't, and this is like a survey control light. So I, I think this is a fantastic suggestion. All right. Um, now, Larry, uh, I, I, the, <laughs> I think you and I have talked about this project before, <laughs> maybe even on a webinar. <laughs> Control, control, you must have control. Uh, the 
it, there's nothing like being 99 to 99.5% accurate and still being two to four feet off. We, we learned early on over 10 years ago, uh, the idea that, you know, uh, a number of things can add up, errors can add up. And, um, and so now what we do is we'll tend to take three instruments out um, when we're going to go 3D scan a, a large facility. So we're adding total station for survey control or, or scanning control. And then um, I found that the cheap or uh, poor man scanning control, uh, one thing you can do just as a uh, triple check is to take you know, electronic tape measure and measure long distances between two target centers and write that down. And then if you're, obviously your total station is your, your strongest laser, your scanner is the next most reliable uh, laser, and then the disto is the least reliable. But if two of them are agreeing on a number and the third one's not, you know which one's probably out of calibration. And, uh, and then you can make a decision from there what has to happen. So we found that uh, working on large facilities, this is a this is really a necessary step in order to uh, uh, maintain quality. Awesome. All right. And uh, yes, not not knowing the job site conditions, site conditions. I think we have a typo in our slideshow. I think that's supposed to be SITE. I bet that's I bet that's Google autocorrect trying to help us out. Yeah, that, that's, that must be what that is. I, I feel like I've learned this lesson about five or six times in, in the scanning career is you, you always want to know what you're getting yourself into. And I think the, the worst time this ever happened is we were sent up to up to Michigan somewhere to to scan one of those logistics storage distribution warehouses. What we weren't told was it was one of the cold storage facilities that was basically a big refrigerator. It was like 40 degrees inside. We had jackets and we were fine, but after a couple hours of being in there, the scanner would get too cold and start to shut down. So we'd have to take it outside and warm it up. We ended up going back and doing that project a second time after I had made a little jacket for the scanner that we could put hand warmers into to keep it warm. So after that, we learned to always start asking the right questions like, um, is the location where you're going going to have power so you can charge your batteries or are you going to rely on the, uh, the car charger instead? Does it have lighting inside or is it all complete darkness because the windows are boarded up and so you'll need flashlights? And is the building secured if it's, if it's a, an abandoned building or are there squatters inside that could potentially kill you? So always ask the right questions before you, uh, before you go out to a job site and end up being surprised. Yeah, I have to say I'm really, really disappointed you don't have a picture of the scanner jacket because it, it, it just makes me think of like a little dog, you know, that's got all it, the extra was, clothing on. And It was a wonderful little thing, yeah. Um, basically just sewed it out of cloth and, and put little pockets in it for the hand warmers. Uh, yeah, we, we really need to like recreate that just to get a good image. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, and then I, I snuck one in here. Um, we we uh, it's kind of similar to uh, some of the prior ones about uh, trying to figure out how to get control uh, out on a job site. But we, uh, you know, never trust the client supplied control points. That's I'm not saying don't use them, but you should never just trust them. We uh, had a massive job out on a, a you know tier one university campus. Uh, you know, they insisted we use their control points, and uh, and so we just kind of went out there with the scanner, set up on control, you know, did a bunch of scanning. I think we had three or four hundred scans, and uh, we got back in the office. Registration was just not working. It was taking us days to to get through it, and uh, finally, you know, we kind of just ignored the survey control, went through cloud to cloud, uh, and used some some kind of backup targets that we had placed. And turns out uh, of the, like 15 control points they gave us, uh, eight of them were bad. Some of them were off by as much as 20 feet. Uh, <laughs> and they were scattered all over the place. So it just, it was, uh, it was a really, really, really painful registration process um, trying to figure out where that error was. So 
this job is actually uh, one of the ones that made me believe firmly that you should you should always do mixed registrations using a combination of survey control, um, cloud to cloud, and targets. Because uh, if you have all three, it kind of goes back to uh, what Larry was saying with uh, the distance or even what Ted was saying with levelness. If you have multiple layers of, um, you know, kind of multiple failure uh, mechanisms, you always have something to fall back to uh, so you can get to the right result. So, all righty. And then last in our category here, uh, Greg, you want to pop back on here and talk about... Uh, misregistering critical scans. Yeah, to touch back just a little bit more on the, the previous slide, you know, I've definitely found an interesting fact with surveyors over time is that they very rarely ever trust anybody else's points. So it's, it's almost like you would think that there was an absolute that, you know, when a survey is done, everybody's always right. But I think it's absolutely opposite in that surveyors rarely trust each other's points and always want to take them again. So let them have their leeway and come back out and it's probably going to serve you better to have uh, points taken more more times than not. Um, so off into my slide about mis misregistering critical scans. This is something that kind of comes across in typical scanning workflow, but there tends to be critical areas to the registration. So I just did a really quick, uh, jokingly, Microsoft Paint diagram of a building with a, a narrow corridor going through it. But let's just say you couldn't come up with some other uh, you know, survey control or you couldn't traverse around the building or get some other kind of control on this, you have to get through that corridor. You really want to pay attention to how you're scanning, whether it's cloud to cloud, whether it's with targets, but you want to just overdo it. So it's a lot better to take two or three or four extra scans than to not have it come out. And then, you know, one side of this building is a little bit rotated. Uh, and it, what ends up happening is walls on one side of the building a little bit thicker than the other as far as the way a, a point cloud reads or something to that effect. So, you know, a couple of different ways to do it is just be very careful with uh, the target placement, get them as wide as possible. Um, the example that I have shown there in the picture is actually a poor example where we kind of have a set of spheres that are lined up almost in the same line, which just doesn't give you a good uh, boundary element. And the way that I describe this to a lot of people is, uh, when you're doing this, thinking of a puzzle piece, and the, the more spread out the edges of that puzzle piece are, the better that that's going to, to fit overall. But if you have just all these points all in the same spot, and if you rotate it just a little bit, it's going to throw everything else off in that puzzle. So taking some time, spreading those, those spheres out, and paying special attention in those critical areas, taking extra scans in those areas. Um, and I know Ted's going to have some additional tricks when you're getting around to these long narrow corridors that'll help out with this. So this is all kind of um, in lieu of taking other survey control at, at higher accuracies. And there's a lot of these small locations that this ends up happening. So just pay attention to those, pay extra uh, time to those and uh, do your due diligence. Yeah, and you know, the, in, in real estate, they say it's location, 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 but uh, with, with laser scanning, it's, it's rotation, 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 because um, mm. translation errors can be a pain, but, they're pretty easy to correct for. They're pretty easy to diagnose, um, but you know, rotation compounds over distance, and so, uh, ugh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it gives me the heebie-jeebies seeing that image with those three targets right next to each other. This makes me curl up into a little ball. Um, so yeah, get get those targets spread out. Um, so with that, we'll hop into uh, some registration workflow mistakes. Uh, so uh, Larry's going to lead us off here and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, talk about extreme regularity. Yeah, uh, having huge misregistrations in, is in extreme regularity areas. It, so where you're going to see you, most of your problems are on tight shafts, tunnels, stair towers, um, uh, towers like, a, you know, a church tower. Um, they're all difficult for cloud to cloud registration. And I know the kids in scanning love cloud to cloud. Oh, it's so fast. It's so easy. Yes. But there is a time and place that targets are an absolute must. And that's where cloud to cloud is most likely to fail. And one degree or 1% 1 of error can be significant in uh, if you've got one degree or 1% 1 of error in any one scan, every scan after that is going to be screwed up. 
and it's going it, to, by the end of this time you get to the end of your scans, you'll see a huge change in what should be there. So uh, I'm a big, big proponent in using spheres and paper targets uh, as much as you can in those sort of areas especially. And then uh, the last tip I'd have is both for yourself or especially if you're the sort of company that has a field tech and a registration guy back in the office and they're not the same person, is to draw scanning maps. Um, when you get into a building where, you know, all the geometry is exactly the same and, you know, you open up any one scan and it looks like 20 other scans that uh, you had done, having that scanning map showing where uh, each scan exists is super beneficial in keeping your registration easy, fast, and accurate. Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a great tip. And, and yeah, this, this reminds me a couple of years ago, we were doing a interior, basically a already built out a core and shell building. They were about to go in and put a hospital uh, a bed, uh, basically a bed wing in. And uh, it was like a 300 something foot long building with probably 15 or 20 structural bays in it, but every bay was identical. And uh, this was right after um, uh, somebody had come out with their brand new automated cloud to cloud registration functionality that was so amazing. And uh, <laughs> and we ended up with a, yeah, we ended up with a building that was, uh, I think, uh, 60 feet long <laughs> instead of 300 <laughs> because all the base just were whoop, <laughs> right on top of each other. Uh, and we were doing it as a test. We'd put targets and everything else up. So the, the real registration was fine, but we just, we were dying laughing <laughs> at that one. Um, so yeah, let's talk about number eight, uh, Zoltan. Yeah, I, th I think Kelly, everybody got burned by the uh, first time they ever tried to do a purely cloud to cloud registration on a project. Uh, so that's a lesson learned. This one, this one maybe is not necessarily a, a lesson learned or a mistake, but just something to think about. And going off of what Larry was talking about, how do you communicate the field conditions to somebody who's going to be registering the scans if, if that's not going to be the same person as the one doing the scanning? Typically, I think the, the one of the better ways to operate is if you have bigger projects where you have two people out on the out on the job site. One person is the scanner mover and the other person is the target sphere mover. And the, the scanner mover decides where the, the scanner should be placed and how to capture all the different areas. The person moving the targets usually knows how the person moving the scanner thinks and, and behaves because they've worked together for so long. And so he or she knows where to put the, the target spheres such that they can be seen and connect the two areas. Then when it comes to time to register the scan data, it should be the person who's moving the scanner around that does the registration because that's the person who knows where it was and what they were thinking when they decided on how to lay out the uh, the flow of the project. But if you're a big big house like uh, like what Greg does, or sometimes Larry goes out and does the scanning and then hands it off to somebody else to do the registration, what you have to have there is some sort of very well-organized, very standardized field notes that explains how the scanners were positioned, what the order of the scanning was, so that at the end of the, the project, regardless of who does the registration, the uh, the outcome should always be the same. Yeah, it's it's <clears throat> field notes and scan plans all all are super useful tools, no doubt. Um, and particularly when you have that bif bifurcated organization. Uh, but uh, Ted Ted's going to tell us a little bit about uh, about hallways, the 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 nightmare of laser scanners on interiors. You no, know, nothing more interesting than a hallway or a corridor, right? <laughs> My goodness. Uh, seriously, though, the um, this is a an area where you you're going to accumulate error. It just is going to happen. And I think that the natural way, way that we we register in most cases, and again, this is um, if you don't have survey control at both ends of that corridor or along it, uh, is that you you're going to go almost in a, a daisy chain and have one scan tied to the next and you know, there, there are best practices where you want to push control out past that next setup so that you're getting 
uh, duplicated control points within multiple positions to, to help mitigate that error. Um, but what we've what we've found on the registration side is that there are different methods that you can use as that secondary QA. Again, these are these are safety nets. They're not necessarily what I would recommend doing every time. But uh, with our long corridors, we we try to take those notes out in the field because we're one of those big shops that has a department of registration technicians that sit there and tie everything together. And we've got a couple dozen uh, scan teams out there gathering information. So to standardize all that in those scan maps, they can go through and select um, the, the fewest possible scan positions to see all the way through the corridor. And then we've, we have a, a training session within our organization that helps people understand, helps our registration tech become very proficient at what we call hand stitching. So we're, we're taking those few scan positions and by hand aligning them uh, just about as accurately as we can and then setting that to the side. Now, what that might mean just in a very simple situation here is we've got a long hallway. Let's say that from one scan position, I can see about 100 feet in either direction. Now, that's not going to provide me enough information for the data processing, so I will need to populate that with a bunch of other scans. Um, but I can use that one scan and say, okay, I can see the termination of this corridor on both sides from this individual position. I'm going to set this aside, and then I'm going to register to the right there. You see the accumulation of scan positions down that hallway, and then I'm going to pull that one outlier back and just overlay it to make sure that I'm dimensionally correct and, and I don't have sort of a, a deviation in the angle or a curvature happening along that corridor. Now, this is one. Um, you can, you know, push out and use two, and then, you know, with a, a two-station setup, maybe you're working with one way over on one end and on the other, and um, the, the key is really just to minimize those core sort of structural scans, we call them, and then um, treat that as your, as your uh, background to populate the rest. Yeah, and I... I... I, I love this solution. The, the uh, you know, one of the things I always would tell our uh, our techs uh, before they went out in the field uh, during training was the more boring and uninteresting a space is, the more scans you will need <laughs> to successfully register it. I think there's this natural inclination to take more scans where areas are interesting, um, but you know, particularly if you're using any feature-based registration like cloud to cloud. Uh, those are easy to register. <laughs> it's the hallways where you need you need a lot more infill. But this is a, this is a great tip. Um, Greg, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about? Uh, let's get us in alignment here. <laughs> yes, rotation, rotation, rotation. So this actually comes over to the the modeling uh, side of things as well when you're looking at it and how uh, things get affected. So we had a, a project, you can see the overall project grid there, fairly large uh, footprint for an old manufacturing plant. I wanna say about a thousand feet on, on either end. And even though everything was on survey control, looked really well, you brought it in, it looked really or orthogonal. You'll see there's a, a slight difference there from either a zero or a 360 degrees to get things really aligned. And so there's kind of two ways you can handle it is you can go back to the uh, registration software and make some corrections to get things kind of perfectly aligned, or you can uh, kind of go back and, and reroute that in Revit. The, the hard piece is like when you, you gotta make that decision early on, uh, because what can happen is even that tiny little rotation in there, as you start modeling, if you get too far down the line in your modeling workflow and that's not set, now what do you do to fix everything? Can you truly rotate the entire project? And if you think about all of your alignments, then your project becomes almost a, that parallelogram as opposed to you know fully rotated. So doing a lot of QA, QC up front, and sometimes this is like a, a temporary export to get it in either on AutoCAD or Civil 3D or Revit, and doing a QC check to check all of your alignments. And really the, the one key thing is column grids, if you can get them. Um, to really align that in a project, figure out if that's going to work before continuing on down to the rest of the project, because there's nothing like having to go back and redo all that modeling as opposed to a, you know, a slight rotation in there. So even at that small 0.01 degree over that distance of a building would be two inches, which is typically outside of the tolerances of what we would typically expect to provide a client with. So just be very careful with it. 
Yeah. Yes, rotation, rotation, rotation. <laughs> it gets you every time. Uh, uh, and it, here we are talking about control again, Larry. You, you are a control freak, aren't you? <laughs> what? I, I, first of all, I need you to call me by my proper name. And uh, no. Uh, so state clean coordinates and Revit estimates. Um, uh, Revit estimates. Revit estimates the location of point clouds. And when it gets out past 10 miles, um, you're going to start seeing graphical errors. We haven't uh, pinned it down to an exact number, but it, it usually uh, has something to do as well with populating the scene with the model. So if, it's, if you use true state plane coordinates and your point cloud is actually 1,000 miles from the origin, Chances are it'll look fine at the beginning, but then as you start to go, you'll start to notice as you zoom in and out, the point cloud will bounce around up to six inches around your, your project. And you, you may build a wall and then come back to it a minute later and, and it looks like you didn't build the wall in alignment with the point cloud. That's a clue that, that this is going on. And FYI, Somebody said a long time ago, oh, it's Revit's good up to 20 miles. That's a diameter. It's really 10 miles from the origin is when these uh, problems begin. So how do you fix it? The way you fix it in order to keep a true coordinate system is to truncate the coordinates. Have your surveyor, if you're not the surveyor, have your surveyor chop off um, the front end of the coordinates as far as they can until they start to get to unique numbers and get those coordinates as small as possible uh, in order to avoid this issue. So, so, so this is an area where, where, where laser Larry control freak Klein Kemper <laughs> and I uh, sometimes have violent disagreements. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the underlying problem is, you know, Revit uses, uh, you know, basically has has a floating point error on the graphics, and so while the under underlying database is fine, you know, up to huge numbers, uh, its ability to display those on screen starts to fall apart. Uh, and so, you know, if you're modeling based on what you see on the screen, you can get into trouble real fast. So, yeah, whether you're using shared coordinate systems to to effectively get the coordinates to be uh, small, uh, or uh, or modifying the coordinates uh, to get it to something that will just uh, show up and come in. Uh, yeah, it definitely something to be aware of. Also, random pro tip to throw in for anybody that doesn't know this already, Revit does not understand the existence of US survey feet, which is what pretty much every survey right. in, in the United States is taken using. Uh, Revit only understands international feet. And uh, most people don't know there's a difference and it's like six parts per million. So it's a tiny, tiny, tiny difference. But if you're dealing with state plane coordinates that are, you know, 6 million, 12 million feet, that can add up to, you know, six to 10 feet of deviation. Uh, so something else to be very careful with when you're working with large, uh, large coordinate systems uh, in Revit is uh, if you're bringing something in that's US survey feet, uh, you're gonna, you're gonna run into some alignment issues, so. All right, Ted. <laughs> elevations. I didn't say elevation, elevations, elevations earlier, but maybe I should have. You know, it applies. And I'll tell you what, before I get into this, uh, thank you, Kelly, for bringing up the whole state plane international, or I'm sorry, um, U.S. survey versus international feet measurement. And that's, um, that's something that has been floating around as, a, as an issue for a long time. And it's commonly misunderstood or not even recognized. So um, that's a, a very important thing to consider, especially as we get more engaged in, in job sites with large coordinate bases or you know the state plane coordinates being applied. And I strongly suggest everybody gets familiar with it fast. Yeah, and you know, the, the, the easy solution is to just always scan in meters because it will always come in correctly. Um. <laughs> yeah. 
if you don't want to deal with it. But you know, I don't I don't want to start a flame war by suggesting that the uh, metric system might be in you know superior in some way, shape, or form. Let's go Oops, metric. We'll save that. Let's go metric. <laughs> we'll save that for another webinar. Uh, with the elevation, uh, we we've noticed with a lot of the we've talked. Uh, in many of these slides about the cloud to cloud registration and and the the rising popularity of it you know i think it's something that we all need to watch it's definitely going to you know they're going to improve the algorithms continuously and and we'll we'll start to see it develop as a standard and once it does i i don't know that you know a traditional target based workflow will remain as competitive you know when you're when you're in a bid situation so um you know we test it out on a regular basis and evaluate and one of the the issues that we were, were seeing arise in the workflow of cloud to cloud is that many of them are hyper focused on that plan view, that top down, and they they'll get really close. They'll allow you to manipulate the the scans themselves to really dial it in. Um, but once it is dialed in, I don't see a whole lot of automatic prompting to kick it over into profile and inspect the elevation. So what we have here is just a, a demonstration of that plan view being very accurate in a cloud-to-cloud -cloud type uh, workflow, but then kicking it over into the profile, when you take that cross-section, we see all the different floor elevations stacked on each other there. So, you know, horizontal, usually pretty good, pretty easy to inspect, but don't forget to flip it over and take a look at that, that, Z, that elevation view as well. Yeah, great, great tip. Um, yeah, again, always do use multiple registration methodologies when you can. <laughs> so let's, let's move into some modeling workflow mistakes here. Um, uh, Greg, you want to talk to us about lucky number 13? Lucky 13, that is actually my lucky number. Uh, so not fully understanding the customer expectation. So a particular job that we worked on, uh, we were doing really well with the modeling, uh, turned over a project as a initial review for the client before the final handover. And uh, one of the unexpected expectations was that the model was going to be used for class detection, routing of new utilities through a space. And what was important was that they needed to know if they were going to hit any pipe runs or any steel, et cetera. And the facility was big enough, I would say 45 to 50 foot column spacings uh, with probably not enough hangers on the pipes that the pipes were sagging a substantial amount. I would say in sometimes three inches up to four inches in some cases, and which seems like there's an, an underlying problem there as well. But we actually had to go back and remodel things based upon the actual conditions of the piping. Now there are some utilities out there, you know, clear edge, uh, having some utilities for that that actually will extract based upon the length of the pipe and break it up into segments for you so that is feasible but you want to be careful not to straighten those out and that's what we all tend to do in these building conditions is you know we like to see things nice and straight and orthogonal on our plans and, and design drawings but in the real world they really aren't And so just how important is it and how are those models going to be used um, because you may adjust your deliverable based upon those use cases so don't leave that out of a proposal or understanding a client's workflow is find out what they're using the models for before you decide how you're going to model those objects. Yeah, great, great point. Yeah, uh, begin with the end in mind, right? All yeah. right. And All I'm right, laser, laser Larry. <laughs> I'm gonna build on what Greg just said, um, really, you know, all pipes, there's a lot of sagging going on out there. And uh, it, especially if you're using Revit, um, you know, Revit trying to constantly connect, uh, show accurate modeled uh, lines and, and what you're trying to do, it can be very, very difficult and time consuming. So one is, you know, establish a tolerance with your client upfront. At what point, you know, is is do you need to model the sag of something? And then two, understanding, like Greg said, you know, what is the model going to be used for? Is it going to be used for collision detection, MEP, or architectural design? And those three uh, different uses 
care about very different things. So collision detection doesn't really care about connectivity. Um, architectural design doesn't typically care about SAGs or co connectivity for a large part. Um, but MEP doesn't care about SAGs, but they, they definitely need it connected. And so if you know which one of those areas to focus the most on, well, it's nice to have all three. Uh, you can save time and get it to your client in, in the time and money that they can afford. Hello. Great. Yeah, great suggestion. Yeah, sorry, I was a little little slow on the trigger finger there with the mute button. Uh, <laughs> so, um, <Expect> heckling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if if you if you dish it, you have to take it. So, Ted, tell us about number fifteen here. I know it's not a, it's not exactly a modeling ish. Uh, it's it's not a modeling problem, but it often often shows up during the modeling process. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. And that's um, really the focus of this is that you, when you, it makes it into modeling, we talked about separate groups that are doing separate things, whether it's the field, the registration modeling. Um, this information, if it makes it through your registration process and into the model, um, it can cause some, some oddities on that side that will typically grind you to a stop. So um, when we're looking at a large building space, some, some techniques here are to break in your your scans into three different segments or three different groups. Uh, one being the the exterior loop, so that envelope. Uh, whether or not the the facade is included in your scope of work, uh, this is a great way to create just sort of a, a container for the rest of your information to go into during the modeling process. Um, the the other thing we try to break out is um, any interior corridor that traverses the entirety of the space. And we treat that separately, and then we fill in the rest of the space there, uh, marked in blue, with additional scan positions. And once that's completed, you have basically three checks on each one of those components to make sure that you're not accumulating either a, um, an expansion or a contraction within your, your information. Again, it's not gonna be obvious uh, anywhere through the process, especially when it gets into the creation of the model, um, but it could have dramatic impacts when you're you're trying to fit everything together. All right, in case we lose Kelly, we're going to uh, move on to Greg. Tell us about number 16. Yeah, and to, to add on for Ted, you know, I can't tell you the number of times people say hey i don't want you to scan the outside i only need what's inside the building but that scan outside is certainly a, a helpful check especially if you're trying to close those loops so don't always or don't necessarily negate those outside scans um so this is a little bit of a setup uh whatever modeling platform you're using we're talking uh revit here and the way you're setting up levels and grids these are kind of critical to the rest of the project um, be critical of yourself as you're setting up the project for those levels. Uh, establish those typically at stairwells. That's uh, typically how a surveyor would do it. They would take spot elevations at those stairwells and establish the rest of the floor from there. Because when we get into these old buildings in the 1800s, uh, even, even younger than that, the floors are not flat, the walls are not straight, they're not plumb. So you really have to establish a good datum to build everything else off of. Uh, and you don't want to have this varying up and down too much. So understand some of that design intent also. So if you were to design this building from scratch from day one, put pen to paper and do this, uh, and the, the building comes out to be 60 foot four and, and three quarter uh, on the, the layout of the scan conditions, do you need to round that off to an inch? Because that's how maybe it was intended to be because that, that wall varies in and out a little bit. So I have some idea on design intent. And the other huge thing uh, is a good understanding of construction tolerances. Um, different materials have different tolerances, whether you're talking about drywall or steel or masonry. And so, you know, they're going to have you know, different varying errors in straightness and levelness and plumbness. So keep those in mind as you're doing them and try to think of that with the design intent in mind as well. Um, you get too far down the project and you have to switch something, it's going to screw up a whole lot of stuff without those datums being correct. Yeah, this is, you, you can't get rid of me that easily, Zoltan. Yeah, hey, 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 yeah, you stepped in. I actually did have a cutout for a second there. 
uh, we, we had some bad storms in Texas uh, yesterday, y'all, so, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, services are a little spotty today. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, uh, the, the, the last two on this one really speak to me, Greg, because this is, you know, one of the struggles we had early on, uh, looking at outsourcing modeling of laser scan data. It's, it's a, it's a tough thing to do if the people doing the modeling don't kind of have that industry specific knowledge, uh, you know, local construction techniques, all that kind of stuff, because uh, there's a lot of interpretation that goes on when you're modeling from point cloud data. And if you don't have a good basis for that, uh, you can get some some pretty useless uh, uh, results out of it. Yep. Uh, but uh, sometimes it's just a matter of uh, being able to see what you're trying to model from, isn't it, Larry? Yes. So uh, uh, early on, I noticed that it, the background color of your screen uh, can actually uh, determine what you see. And especially if you're scanning in color versus just black and white intensity. Black and white intensity shows up pretty well on, on most screens, um, but you'll still see some things that you won't see depending on what your background is. Um, if something is all white, it's not going to show up very well on a white screen. If something's very dark or black, it's not going to show up on a black screen. Um, and that's why most of our, our group uses some sort of unnatural occurring uh you know blue screen screen um as a background if you need see in this image up at, towards the top there's details on the white background that you don't see very well on the black background and also the joists that you see uh in the top right corner of the image in the black background they show up but they're not nearly as clear on the white background so that's why I'm, I'm constantly telling people, okay, uh, before you finish, change the background, take a look at different things. That's a great suggestion. Yeah, and it's it's a it's very an art it's very an architecty suggestion, Larry. <laughs> um, all right. Let's use and, the uh, proper colors. Yes, yes, yes. Change your background color. Um, so uh, th this one's this one's a uh, this one's a good one. I don't think most people know this this tool exists, so take it away, Ted. Oh, we'll do. So it, I think you can you can experience a whole lot of uh, modeling troubles when you start adding all that information from the scan data. And if you think about a space like like what's displayed here, over on the left side, you can see there you've got a lot of plane surfaces, right? You've got the, the floor, the walls, the ceiling, and then you have the complexity of all the the systems. So, like you had mentioned on an earlier um, subject, when it gets complex, there's a tendency to scan a whole lot because we're going to capture all those interesting uh, elements, which would, works great, right? Because we're completing that picture of all those um, minor pieces and parts. The problem is we have a redundancy that's occurring in data accumulation on all those flat surfaces. So within this, this example, you're looking at probably 70% of the, the size of that point cloud, the weight of that point cloud existing on those planar surfaces, uh, remaining 30% being like the corners, the edges, the, uh, the conduits themselves. So what we started doing, because we wanted to see those finite details, but it was really dragging our processing down, is we, we began to work on creating algorithms that sit on top of um, open source point cloud processing software platforms that you can get online. Um, and what we uh, used those for was to recognize the plane surfaces and then restrict the filtering specifically to those planes uh, that would reduce and decimate that point cloud way down. So over on the right-hand side there, you can see anywhere where that algorithm recognized the planar surface, uh, it would decimate that point cloud down. There's still information there, but I think we had like a one-inch gap in between points. And that's okay, right? Because it's representing that plane. Uh, we're going to be okay with that to, to draw on our walls and our floor. But what it's retained is anything that has complex geometry. So you can see along the edges of the where the floor meets the walls, around the door there in the background. It's keeping all that rich information anytime geometry changes, which is really what your modeling team is going to be looking for. Uh, it's also retaining all the information on your piping, any element that doesn't have that flat surface. So while you know we call it Z-Simplify, we've built it for our team here, I know that it, 
similar functionality is available out there in the market. Uh, so if you don't want to put all that effort in, uh, you can probably poke around and find something that that'll satisfy a very similar workflow to this. But it makes a tremendous um, uh, a tremendous improvement in that workflow of modeling. Yeah, and there's yes, yeah, you know, yeah, there's some other takes on this. You know, one of the one of the things we can do with Edgewise is is segment out the point cloud into you know basically points associated with walls, points associated with pipes, points associated with uh, you know all the different things that 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 we can model that way you can bring in you know what's left the points you don't have modeled or uh, or you can bring in just the points associated with a given system that's another way to to make things a lot easier on your computer system uh, just have the points that you care about at that point in time when you're working on the model so great great tip that's so, so valuable yeah it, it it either way you slice it uh, uh, pun intended. Uh, it, it works out. Uh, so we're we're coming up on uh, 55 after. So I want to go straight to Q and A. Uh, there are some bonus tips. Um, uh, we may uh, bring bring some of these up uh, as we uh, as we go through Q and A, uh, looking at some of the Q and A questions. But uh, let's uh, let's just jump straight to that. So first um, first question we have, and this one is is you know, may incite a riot or may not. Uh, what is better, spheres or black and white targets? Uh, thank you for asking that, Jonas. Uh, if you if you don't mind, Kelly, I, I can pitch in some little background information because I've I've used both uh, on many occasions in a lot of projects. And the way I like to look at them is is they kind of have a separate purpose for for each of them. You think about the the checkerboard targets as being these cheap paper things that you can have a nearly unlimited supply of, yet they're not as accurate as the spheres, but they also have an advantage of you can put as many of them out as you wish and they'll stay put. Unlike your sphere targets, which you typically take only 12, maybe 24 out to a job site and they move around with the scanner. So the way I looked at this problem was the, the checkerboard targets are the permanent registration points and the sphere targets are the ones that move around with the scanner. The, uh, they're both limited in their accuracy based on their size and the range from the scanner. So the bigger the sphere, the farther you can put it from the scanner at any given resolution to be able to use it for registration, or you turn up the scanner's resolution to capture those spheres farther away. But typically, your scanner resolution is depending on what you want to capture, not how far you want to move the scanner. The checkerboards are the same way. The bigger they are, the, the better the registration on them is. And we would typically print them on 11 by 17 paper instead of people typically print them on 8.5 by 11. And uh, yeah. the other problem with paper checkerboards is it's not only a matter of range, but also angle. You really want to be perpendicular to the paper checkerboards as much as you can, but not exactly, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, if you get too much of an angle to the paper checkerboards, then you don't get a good point. And yeah, errors you, go up. Right. And the, the flip side of this that I found out is if you're directly in front of the checkerboard and you're exactly perpendicular to it, it can get washed out by the uh, the glare of the intensity of the laser. So. Uh, I'm not going to play favorites and tell you which one's better, but uh, my bottom line is they each have their purpose, and I typically use both of them on a project. Well, and I was going to say, there's this, if, if the attendees pick up a theme, I, I think uh, most of us are, are, are not fans of saying, one, there's one target to rule them all, there's one scanner to rule them all, there's one uh, registration method to rule them all. Um, I think once you get out in the field and you do, you know, a couple hundred scan jobs, you you realize that uh, usually you want to have both <laughs> or all three um, because they all have strengths and weaknesses. And by having multiple versions, uh, you, you can actually kind of counterbalance uh, the strengths and weaknesses of each individual approach. So um, yeah, long, narrow, long, narrow uh, quarters, uh, spheres are great, towers are where you have a long narrow space the spheres are going to rock uh, but there's nothing better than leaving a bunch of paper targets behind in hidden in uh, uh, janitor's closets and and fire extinguisher cabinets 
so that if you ever have to come back, you can tie back into things easily. Yeah, amen. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we've got another uh, couple questions here. I've found that zigzagging spherical targets down a long hallway gives the best result. That's a not really a question, but that's an interesting point. Um, so that's I, I haven't personally tried that approach. Any anybody on the panel tried doing a zigzag of targets? Yes, um, I've typically when I set out a long run of scans one after another, the three target spheres that that kind of hopscotch with the scanner if you keep putting them in the same configuration every time then you can get a situation where one group of three gets registered to a different group of three and so if you vary that pattern as you go down it creates more of a unique pattern of targets for each scan and kind of zigzagging them down the hallway is a is a good way good way of doing that so Whoever, uh, whoever sent that in, I totally agree. That's an excellent tip. All right. Um, so this is a clarifying question for Ted. Um, are you saying performing a single high resolution scan in the middle and normal resolution scans elsewhere? So this is referencing your hallway example. And I, I think that is what you're suggesting, correct, Ted? That is, that is. If, you, if your team is, is aware out in the field, uh, I would recommend that they that they position a couple of high resolutions. It takes a little bit longer, but you're going to get a greater density of data at that distance to, to help you align. Um, but it's not required, right? So if they didn't think about it and they ran through at their their just typical uh, density, then you can still go through and pick out. You might have to pick two instead of one, uh, but the workflow will would be applicable either way. Awesome. Um, I'll take this one. We have somebody asking, uh, so Stephen, uh, Stefan is asking, uh, is there any suggestions on how to use state plane coordinates within Revit? So Revit has three coordinate systems. Uh, there's the internal one that users never get to see. Uh, uh, it's like uh, Fight Club. The first rule is you don't talk about the internal coordinate system. Um, and then there's the uh, the second one, which is the project origin. And then there is the survey point, uh, survey origin. Uh, and uh, basically what you need to know is uh, you should never move the project origin away from the internal origin. Otherwise things get really hinky and it's hard to predict behavior. Um, but you can move the survey point. And so uh, the trick is to set up your survey uh, point, uh, basically 6 million, 12 million feet, whatever, uh, away from the, uh, the actual project origin. And you can do that by establishing shared coordinates in Revit. And then when you bring anything into Revit that's on state plane coordinates, you basically tell it to use that shared coordinate system. And then it will drop everything in very close to the internal origin. And you only get that graphic issue Larry was talking about if you have a discrepancy between the geometry or the points and the internal origin. So by, by using uh, shared coordinates in Revit, you can definitely work with state plane. You just have to be really careful about the fact that Revit doesn't know what survey feed are. Um, and you've got a couple choices there. Uh, if everything coming into Revit is in survey feed, um, the fact that it has a scaling error isn't a problem because on the you know, size of a typical project, what, you know, six parts per million is inconsequential. But if you're gonna have some stuff coming in metric, some stuff coming in international, whatever, I usually tell people convert to metric when you do your exports. So export from your survey software into a metric uh, format and then bring that into Revit because there, fortunately there's only one meter uh, where there are unfortunately two different feet. Um, but I guess it'd be hard to dance with only one foot. Oh. Sorry, that was a terrible joke. Um, so let's see, any other questions and then we'll pop off. Oh, we do have one question on the Z Simplify for, for Ted. How do you Z Simplify, Ted? Oh, geez, that's not something that I can cover in a minute, but um, I'm more than happy to dive into it with anybody that's interested. So um, yeah, my info is available LinkedIn. I'm sure that um, the good folks at Clear Edge would be able to share my contact info. But um, yeah, reach out directly, and I'm I'm happy to walk anybody through that's interested or put you in with the right folks. 
All righty. Well, we are we are two minutes past time. Um, <laughs> we've we've had a lot of people, uh, you know, come in shouting "Amen" uh, in the in the question field instead of asking questions. So apparently, it's uh, resonating with uh, with some of the audience. So. Um, I, didn't, again, I didn't realize everybody was having such a religious experience at our, at our webinar. Yeah, no, we've got a lot of people going, metric, always metric. Uh, <laughs> thank, you, thank you for that, Nathan. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and actually an amen for Larry. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, but we'll, we'll wrap this up. Uh, and if there's any questions we were not able to answer in the Q&A, uh, we'll try and follow up or direct you to somebody uh, to follow up with. Um, and again, the recording will be available in about a week, plus or minus. And um, yeah, thank you all so much. And thank you to our wonderful, wonderful panelists. Um, thank you, Greg, Ted, Larry, and Zoltan. Uh, so yeah, everybody have a wonderful rest of your Thursday. Thanks uh, for your night, Miss Kelly. Thanks, everybody, Thanks, for your time.